The current app development is experiencing problems. If we don't get it working, does it really matter? Will it make a difference to prevent a second wave? Does it really matter, Lisa and Andy? Um, yeah, I think it does matter. And we you know, very much supported the government in trying to set this up because if, in the end, if you get the app up and running, it will save lives. The problem is that the government were warned repeatedly from the outset that the path that they were taking was not going to work because the technology just wasn't compatible with a lot of phones. Now, there were other countries like Germany and Australia who were taking a similar path to our government, trying to develop their own technology, realised that it wouldn't work, listened to those warnings and actually went down a different path. And as a result, Germany has just managed to launch their app uh, yesterday and is quite confident about how that's going to work. So we've really got to start breaking the pattern here, which is of a government that shuts people out, doesn't listen to advice, doesn't seek to learn from expertise here in the UK and overseas, and then finds later that they've got to revisit those plans because they've unravelled very, very quickly. We've seen it over and over again with a whole host of things. One of the real outstanding problems with all of this at the moment is that you've got public health directors across England saying that they still don't get, the GPs in local areas don't get the results of tests because the government set up their own private sector testing facilities around the country. So GPs just simply don't know when their patients are being testing, tested positive for COVID. Public health directors are looking closely at local outbreaks and having to make decisions about managing local outbreaks. But because they're not getting that information, they just simply don't have the tools that they need to do the job. So okay. we need a reset here. It's right for the government to abandon a system if it isn't working, but we need to ask ourselves, why is it so often that we end up having to unravel plans over and over again because we didn't get them right in the first place? Now, Steve, I want to ask you in not only what you think about this particular question, but also just tell us a little bit about how you're managing at Crystal Palace, because you've got a kind of app of your own there, haven't you? Yes, it's not a tracing app. I mean, I would, on, on the app, it, it seems incredible to me that so many countries are developing their own app. I mean, I would have thought, uh, certainly if the EU has a purpose, that that might be one thing that they could have got everybody's heads together on. We all want exactly the same app doing exactly the same thing, which seems incredible. We have a very simple app where the players and the staff fill in any symptoms um, because that's as efficient a way of, of catching um, the disease early, sometimes as testing, where there can be a lag between the time you test and, 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 and testing positive. But, you know, developing these apps is extremely complex. You know, as somebody who had a business that, that developed this kind of thing, the timescales that we're trying to do it in are very, very compressed. I'm pleased today that they're adapting to Google and Apple technology, which, you know, I would, I would hazard a guess they might be better at producing stuff than, you know, people in, in, in our government. So, look, let's hope that we can all get together. The blame game on both sides, I think, really does need to stop. It's a very difficult situation. Nobody was prepared for this situation. The, you know, we can say Germany have done slightly less worse than everybody else. We, we'll need to look back Well, they've done a thing. lot better in terms of their, their death toll. They have done better in terms of their death toll, but I think when we look back on this, 10,000 deaths is too many. You know, this, this, the, the, for this to get to the extent that it did, into the amount of countries that it has, you know, the world really needs to look at it and make sure that these kind of outbreaks are jumped on way before the kind of things we're discussing now, because we are talking about a pandemic that is broadly out of control in the world uh, that we're trying to get on top of, and it is going to be extremely difficult. And we do need to come together as a country, private enterprise, the governments, both sides of the house, and try and find a solution in the next two or three months, or we really could be in a terrible situation. Mike, you've had your hand up from the start. Yes, I was going to say, with Apple and uh, Google, there's uh, good parts in both applications. Surely these companies could come together for once, you know, because there's a big panic pandemic going on, and sort of resource put the resources together. Well, I think they are putting their resources together for the benefits uh, of this particular uh, app, as I understand it. Charles? Yes. Um, it just seems that this is just another moment of government bluster actually hitting reality. So Matt Hancock and Baroness Harding said today that they backed both horses of the Google and the Android model and the NHS app. But they've always insisted until this point that they were only going to pursue the NHS app. So it just seems that the government are trying to make it seem that they're trying to do the best job possible. But when it comes to reality, they want to cover up and not 
pretend that they've done anything wrong. Jed? Well, I think that the app can only really be an adjunct. I think that there are technological limitations in the app in terms of providing a, a nationwide service. Um, and really, it's about having a functioning public health infrastructure that is able to deal with local outbreaks locally. And unfortunately, the government has chosen to centralise and use a private company, Serco, to take the lead on this. And I think that a lot of public health uh, officials and workers, as, as Lisa said, are frustrated that they're not receiving the information. They've kind of been shut out, whether intentionally or not, I don't know. But they do feel that they've been shut out. And that does then limit us in terms of our ability to do exactly what we're all asking for. As, as Steve said, where, where's that can-do attitude? Can, can we crush this virus so that society can get back to normal and our kids can get back into school and our businesses can get up and running. And a lot of the, the businesses and the, the particular sectors that are looking to get back, frankly, don't have much confidence. And what about your business? I mean, getting line of duty, I say that as an unashamed fan, I have to confess, getting that back up and running. Well, it's interesting that you give that specific example because we had an outbreak during the, the shoot over in Belfast when there was the, the test and trace system originally, the containment phase, and we were able to deal with that and we were able to carry on uninterrupted. Um, then towards the, the end of the, the shoot that got curtailed, we had another outbreak and I was quite surprised to learn that we weren't able to do testing and tracing, the, the system had been stopped. And that was the point where really when we, we looked at it, we knew that we couldn't protect our workforce and we had to stop. And that was nine days before the lockdown. So the writing was on the wall then. And uh, I think a lot of businesses are just going to take responsibility for it themselves. I think that, that each TV production will organise their own testing and they will look after each other and do their best that way. And James, obviously we had the announcement today from the Health Secretary about switching horses, I think was the analogy Matt Hancock used. Um, having, but he also said we, we backed both horses throughout the NHSX app and also this other app, kind of Google Apple app. What I don't understand about that is if, if the government has been backing both those things, it's now jettisoned one, why isn't the other one ready? Well, the, um, I mean, these apps, we, you know, we talk about, um, uh, I mean, Lisa implies there was a, a, an obvious right answer. There clearly wasn't an obvious right answer. Yeah, but answer. if you've been backing them both, and other countries are already introducing their apps. How come the other one isn't ready? So the, the idea that there was an obvious right answer is, is wrong. Otherwise, every country in the world would have done the same thing. That's not what happened. Germany as an example. And, and what Matt did was exactly the right thing to do, which is not to put all our eggs in one basket, to make sure that we were developing the, um, uh, you know, the, the in-house app, as it were, and the, and the, and the app... Uh, through third parties. So how and ready it was is that? And it, was, and it was tested on the Isle of Wight, and the decision was made to go with the uh, to go with the uh, the other option. And that's the right thing to do, and it's about learning as we go through this and making the decision. Um, uh, I don't know exactly when the app will go live because we, uh, we heard but, it might not be till winter. No. But uh, so I, as I say, I, I don't want to guess and speculate. I don't know exactly when the app will go live, but obviously we will continue working with international uh, friends and partners. We will learn from what other countries uh, are, are doing, and we are the whole world is learning as we go, uh, and to make sure that we uh, bring about uh, a test and trace app that can be can be used to to protect us all. Gareth. Yeah, do we do you not think that the public are going to see this as another U-turn again? And it's going to be even harder to get the public on board to actually use the app when it does become live. But do you worry about that? L lo loss no, of public I, confidence? No, because I mean, it's critical, again, it's one of these things. We, we use the word U-turn. I mean, I was in business before I came into uh, into politics, and if you're going to test a couple of options, see which one progresses best, see which one works. And then, and then invest your time effort in the better performing one of those options. That's not a U-turn. That's why it was tested on the Isle of Wight. OK. That's why we are, we, you know, we, we learn from the experience. So you have been trialling the other option on the Isle of Wight as well? well is it, uh, no, but the point... You, that, oh, you haven't? The, well, the point that Matt was saying is... Hang we, on, no, I don't, hang on, I just want to be... 
Because now I really don't understand. So if, if, if Matt Hancock said you were backing both options and you were trialling the NHS X app, presumably you were trialling the other one as well. Otherwise, that's what backing both options is. No, that's... No. Isn't it? No, that's... So the, the test of our in-house app was done on the Isle of Wight. We were keeping our options open but for so the you use of either. So you trialled the other one? But, but the, that other, the other system is being, tr is being used uh, more widely. So doing a discrete UK-only trial for that one, my understanding, and I would So we haven't trialled it, but you think about other, you're but, relying on other countries. Because it's being used elsewhere. Right. So it's not, necess it's not necessary for us to, to trial both. Yeah. But OK, say, I've got that clear. The reason we were trialling is to make sure that we chose the best option, because each option had their advantages and disadvantages, and it's not as, it was not clear-cut at the start of this process that, the, that, the, uh, that this would be the better option. That's why you test. I can't overstate how important getting test and trace right and getting it right as quickly as possible is. Everybody who's watching this evening is desperate to try and get back to some sense of normality. Without a robust operational test and trace system, it's impossible to be able to do that safely. We have to be able to find every case and, and isolate it and, and keep uh, and suppress this virus. What is very clear to me is when I had a conversation with the Deputy Chief Medical Officer on the 13th of March, it was around then that we stopped routinely testing and tracing every uh, incident, uh, incidence of coronavirus. And I questioned her hard and I said, why are you stopping the testing? We should be testing every case. And it was down to capacity. And it's been far too late. It was some weeks after that that we suddenly saw a focus on ramping up testing. And great, we've got the capacity. But, James, we haven't had for almost a month now the figures of how many people have actually been tested on a daily basis. And on tracing, as Lisa has said, we need to be working much more closely with, with local authorities. Directors of public health have been crying out to be leading this effort. They are the experts. I didn't watch the Salisbury poisonings earlier this week, but I, I heard in there it showed just how pivotal the role of di the director of public health is. That is what they should be doing. That's what they're experts in. And they should be leading those teams of contact tracers to be tracing every case. Uh, but last week, I was talking to some leaders in, in local government. They haven't got the data. They haven't got the tools. They're still, to some extent, unclear about what their role should be. And this is absolutely critical if we want to open up our economy again. I, th I think it's telling that you got an honest answer about the reason that testing was abandoned in March. What we were told, the public was told, was that it wasn't appropriate for an economy of our size. Well, I think our, our institutions, I feel, you know, we talk about the government all the time letting us down. But, you know, Public Health England uh, made that decision. In Germany, they devolved it very quickly into the mm. local authorities. And I would also say, I mean, we can't have the whole of the United Kingdom hanging on an app developer, developing an app. You know, test and trace is possible to do manually. Most of it, Jed, as you said, will happen manually, mm. even with the app. The app is 15 minutes in proximity, two metres to somebody. Yeah. It's just an adjunct. You it's, can remember if you were with somebody for the 15 whole minutes. Infrastructure. Yeah, so, completely. you know, we, we, we need to get test and trace rolled out manually. And if the app comes along and helps us do it, then great. But we can't wait for that. But it's also <laughs> about people receiving accurate information. When, when you have uh, public health officials, when you have government scientists saying things which are manifestly untrue, which is that it wasn't appropriate. It was actually always about resources, but they didn't admit that. And so now we're in a situation again where, where trust has broken down. People are, are desperate to get good quality information they can rely on from their government, from their public health officials, so that people can make the right decisions and make the right calculations about risk, about how we get back to normal. Okay. I think, uh, Steve, you talk, sorry, Briefly, I, because I just want to move on you to another talked about question. about ending the blame game. I think the public appreciate that we are in an unprecedented situation and no government is going to get it right. But the thing that frustrates me most about this government is that they just don't have the humility to put their hands up when they've actually got it wrong. Uh, or when they do that, they late. say it's a U-turn. They are holding their hands up and saying they got it wrong, well, and then they're told it's a U-turn. So then they, that's I not mean, an environment that's conducive to people making the right decisions, is it? That is the blame game. That's exactly what it no, is. No, but well, isn't but there a difference between making a U-turn on policy and just lying? 
There's a difference well, between those two I things. Certainly think, well, I certainly think that the information, as you just pointed out, that they've received from some of our institutions and scientists, and I'm, I'm not here to defend them blindly, everybody's made terrible mistakes, you know. Where there was a left turn to make, we took the right one in almost every occasion, mm. and we have to learn from it. But I don't think when we look back there'll be any one single reason, you know. We, oh, we, you're absolutely right. Steve. And I think absolutely we have to consider right. that when we move forward, and that's the most important thing, is how we move forward. Well, but, okay. I, I don't but moving think forward involves learning from your exactly. mistakes and being honest. And, and unfortunately, there's that gap between the, in, the, the learning behaviour and the transmission of the information about what has been learned and where mistakes were made. And I, and I think that that is, is problematic for people to have confidence about the information they receive and how they go forward. See the headlines as they happen and watch BBC News live in the app and get the full story with bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Follow the story for all the latest with BBC News.